Welcome back to another AI Practitioner Exam Byte. Reviewing the question from the previous episode, asking us in MLOps what is the primary purpose of implementing continuous model monitoring? The answer is C, to detect when model performance degrades over time. Continuous model monitoring is crucial for identifying when a model's performance starts to decline. This degradation, which is often called model drift or concept drift, can occur due to changes in the underlying data distribution or shifts in user behaviour. While the other options are benefits which can be reached through following an MLOps approach, they do not directly relate to continuous model monitoring. Today we are finishing off the fundamentals of AI and ML domain by looking at how we can measure model performance with the objective, understand model performance metrics, for example, accuracy, area under the rock curve, AUC, and the F1 score. And we're also gonna be looking at business metrics, for example, cost per user, development costs, customer feedback, return on investment, or ROI, to evaluate ML models. Let's start with machine learning metrics, where we're gonna cover three which are used for classification problems. The first is accuracy, which tells us the proportion of correct predictions compared with the total number of predictions made. For example, in a model predicting email spam, if it correctly identifies 90 out of 100 emails, the accuracy is 90%. However, accuracy is not great for imbalanced data sets. Imagine a data set where only 5% of emails are spam. A model that predicts every single message is not spam would have 95% accuracy, but it's completely useless at detecting spam. This high accuracy masks the model's failure on the minority class, in this case, spam emails. That's why we often need other metrics for imbalanced data sets, such as the F1 score. So let's talk about the next metric, the F1 score. Now this is a single number that summarizes how well our model is performing, especially when we care equally about catching all the positive cases, but avoiding false alarms. Going back to our spam filter analogy, the F1 score tries to balance two important aspects of our spam filter's performance. Number one, how good is it at catching all of the spam emails? And number two, how good is it at avoiding marking legitimate emails as spam? The F1 score would be high if your filter catches most spam and rarely misclassifies legitimate emails. So this would be great for assessing the performance of our spam filter, where we probably have an imbalanced training data set with spam emails being less common than legitimate emails or the other way around for some unfortunate inboxes. <laughs> the final metric is area under the rock curve or AUC. Let's start with talking about the receiver operating characteristic or rock curve. We represent the curve on a plane with a Y axis that represents the true positive rate. In other words, how many positive cases are correctly predicted and on the x-axis, that represents our false positive rate. In other words, how many negative cases were incorrectly predicted as positive. And both of these axes are on a range of zero to 1.0. So we can draw a curve that represents the predictions made by the model. So we're gonna draw a curve here at a 45 degree line and I'll call this rock one. So representing the predictions made by one of our models. And along this curve are all of the cutoff thresholds between the classes. So going back to our previous example of email spam, we might determine that the probability cutoff as to whether an email is spam or not is 0 0.5. So that might be around about here. And with this model, that's probably going to be optimal because if we look at it, that's going to be 0 0.5 on both the x-axis and the y-axis. So that provides a good balance between the true positive rate and the false positive rate. However, this model is not very good because it's literally a 50-50 chance as to whether the prediction is correct or not. 
most likely your model won't look like this because it'd be a fairly poor model. A better model would look like this second curve that I'm going to draw. And we'll call that rock two. And the cutoff that you most likely want in this situation is at what we call the knee of the curve. So let's pick another color here to make it clearer. So when I say the knee of the curve, I'm referring to this area up here because that maximizes our true positive rate. So in this case, it might be, for example, 0 0.95, but it minimizes our false positive rate down here, which might be like 0 0.1. We can now also introduce another concept, the area under curve or AUC. This is quite literally the area underneath the rock curve and gives us an aggregated measure of performance across all possible thresholds. Essentially, the model's probability that a randomly chosen positive instance, for example, spam, is ranked higher than a random chosen negative instance, such as not spam. So for our first curve, the AUC down here would be 0 0.5, because it's a 45 degree line, it's literally taking up half of our graph. So our AUC would be 0 0.5, which as we've discussed is no better than a coin toss. Our second curve, might have an AUC which is much better. So this AUC might be 0 0.95, which is obviously a much, much better AUC. Now let's turn our attention to business metrics, equally as important to assess the value of our machine learning model. We first have cost per user. This helps us understand the operational expenses of running the model in production. For example, if we're running a recommendation system that costs $10,000 per month and serves 100,000 users, the cost per user is 10 cents per user. You'd need to assess whether that cost is worth it, such as do you recoup that in sales made on items recommended to customers? Another business metric is development costs. This includes the time and resources spent on data collection, model training, and fine tuning. For example, if it takes a team of three data scientists six months to develop a model at $10,000 per month each, the development cost is $180,000. Customer feedback, that direct input from users can provide invaluable insights into the model's real world performance. For example, users rating a chatbot 4.5 out of 5 stars indicates a high satisfaction with its performance. Return on investment, or ROI. This metric helps us quantify the financial benefits compared to costs. For example, if a predictive maintenance model costs $500,000 to develop and deploy, but saves the company $2 million in prevented breakdowns over a year, the return on investment is 300%. Let's do a review question to finish off this episode. You're evaluating a new email spam filter for your company. The filter has been running for a month and you've collected the following data. Total emails received, 10,000. Actual spam emails, 2,000. Emails correctly identified as spam, 1,800. And legitimate emails incorrectly marked as spam is 300. And our filter's F1 score is 0 0.85. Which of the following statements is true about this spam filter? The filter is perfect at catching all spam emails. B, the filter never misclassifies legitimate emails as spam. C, the filter performs poorly and should be immediately replaced. Or D, the filter balances well between catching spam and avoiding misclassification of legitimate emails. Post your answer to the question in the comments and I'll review it in the next episode where we're also going to be kicking off domain two, fundamentals of generative AI. See you then.